Good one. Uh, we'll see what happens as Keir Starmer and Boris Johnson go at it live from the House of Commons. That's next here on Times Radio. Across the UK, on DAB, online and on your smart speaker. This is Times Radio. It's 12 o'clock. I'm Matt Shirley. This is Times Radio. Up next, it's PMQ's Unpacked. First, a look at the headlines. The Prime Minister is about to face MPs. He's still refusing to apologise over comments he made about the Labour leader and Jimmy Savile last week. The Commons Speaker's called his false suggestion that Keir Starmer had failed to protect the sex offender inappropriate. Elsewhere, a health minister's apologised after admitting she didn't immediately go home after finding out she had COVID. Gillian Keegan learned of the result of a lateral flow test midway through a meeting, but just carried on. She says it was an error of judgment. London's mayor has called for the police and RSPCA to take over uh, to take action over a video of a Premier League footballer kicking his pet cat. Sadiq Khan's also criticised West Ham after Kurt Zuma kept his place in the team for last night's match. And one of Team GB's best medal hopes is heading home from the Winter Olympics empty-handed. Charlotte Banks is world champion in women's snowboard cross, but failed to make it through her quarter-final in Beijing. We'll bring you a full news and sport roundup at half past. But now it's time for this. PMQs unpacked on Times Radio. Order, order. I call Matt Chorley and Tim Shipman. Yes, a very good afternoon to you. It is just gone 12 o'clock on Wednesday, so it must be time for PMQ's Unpacked. We are live on Times Radio. We are live on YouTube, so you can watch along as well. Uh, the cameras are on. Just go to YouTube, search Times Radio, uh, and you can see us. Uh, we've got uh, people. Let us know where you're listening from. Listening in Pyongyang. Greetings from Birmingham, from Portugal, from Landuff. Uh, more Birmingham. Uh, hello from uh, Manchester, Terry. Uh, and in the studio with me, it's Tim Shipman. Not in Pyongyang. Not in Pyongyang. Uh, hello from upstate New York. You people really do have uh, not have better things to do. Uh, it's nice to have you here. Uh, Tim Shipman, what do we expect from PMQs today? Well, I think um, I, predicting what Keir Starmer is going to do is not always straightforward. But the two things I'm looking out for, is he going to make an issue again of the Jimmy Savile comments and the fact that he was harassed in the street? Um, I think there's a lot of people, even on the Tory benches, who are uneasy about that. But equally, there are Conservatives who think that the more that um, the words Keir Starmer and Jimmy Savile appear in the same sentence, um, the more that that will have some knock-on effect to it's the public. Sort of, there's no smoke without fire theory. Yeah, politics, so does yeah. that? Do, do Labour think it's better to move on, or do they want to, to look at that? The other thing I'll be watching um, is what's going on behind Boris Johnson, because now and alongside Boris Johnson on his front bench, he's now made clear that this he shuffle that he did yesterday, moving a few white middle-class men around, um, is not the not the end of it. There's going to be a bigger one later in the year. And does that mean people start to behave themselves, cheer loudly? And do all his uh, cabinet ministers turn up and look enthusiastic? Because not all of them have done so over the previous few weeks. Stephen Barclay, the, the, well, it's quite interesting. So sitting either side of Boris Johnson, you've got Dominic Raab on one side, the actual deputy prime minister, and Stephen Barclay, the second most powerful man in government. Yes, looking frankly like a pair of nightclub bouncers a little bit, aren't they? They've got... Um, <laughs> They're a bit fierce. There's a bit of sort of eyebrow going on there, sort of stern stares, doubtless at the Labour front bench rather than at their Prime Minister. But, um, yeah, if you encountered those two on, uh, late on a Friday night, you wouldn't be terribly surprised. They're quite well-dressed, but beyond that... Um, yeah. Lot if they were packing heat, <laughs> it, wouldn't, it wouldn't come as a shock. You get the sense of both of them. Qu quite a lot of aftershave. Um, let's go. <laughs> let's not get bogged down in that. I think we can go now live to the House of Commons. This is question number one from Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Was the Business Secretary right to say that fraud is not something that people experience in their day-to-day -day lives? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, of course this uh, government and uh, this country uh, despises those who defraud people, and that's why we crack down on, on fraudsters, uh, Mr Speaker. And we've strengthened our anti-fraud task force. We're bringing forward an economic crime bill, Mr Speaker. Uh, but we also attach huge importance uh, to tackling neighbourhood crime and crimes of violence, Mr Speaker. And I'm very pleased that those crimes are down 17%, Mr Speaker. 
Well, the first thing to know is uh, Keir Starmer, knowing the trick, ask a short question. A short question he wasn't expecting. Yes. And the first, I think if you listen back to that answer, the first sort of uh, 20 seconds, it's Boris Johnson going, oh, my God, what do I say to this? Um, but actually he recovered quite well, and he did manage to dredge up a few details of things the government is doing on the, the task force and the neighbourhood crimes thing and the crime bill. Um, and, yeah, he'll be frantically flicking through his papers now looking for something else some to more say. Crime stuff. I suspect we might hear how many police officers they are recruiting at some stage. Just just in case you're not across this, this is quasi quite the business secretary, at the weekend uh, was challenged because previously Boris Johnson has claimed that crime was falling by 14%. But that is only true if you take fraud out of the figures. And Kwasi Kwarteng said at the weekend, the Prime Minister was talking about crime that people experience in their day-to-day -day lives, which in terms of burglary, in terms of physical injury, has gone down. I mean, even Martin Lewis, the money-saving expert man, has piled in and has said that the uh, uh, Kwasi Kwarteng was call, uh, caused outrage with his comments and said he should apologise. Um, it does seem quite extraordinary that you can claim crime is down if you just take out some of the crimes. Well, and uh, I think anyone who's got elderly relatives who are getting their door knocked or, um, you know, phishing emails trying to extract cash from them would uh, would think that this was a pretty live problem for a lot of people. And also, you know, it, to, if you lose money, and it, you know, everyone's had it, whether your credit card's scammed or, you know, um, online things, you know, that is crime. That's You've lost something that wasn't yours just because somebody hasn't broken into your house uh, to do it is uh, is another question. So there we are. That's um, I do wonder if he might. Uh, uh, I, I wonder if we might be in for a potpourri p PMQs where Keir Starmer he might just across. keep moving in to keep Boris Calls Johnson not uncomfortable. Flicking through his folder, trying to find the next answer. Okay, let's go back to the House of Commons then. Uh, this is uh, question number two from Keir Starmer. Mr. Speaker, the the Prime Minister's answer's got a big hole in it. We've had lockdowns for the last two years. Two crimes that people could commit were online fraud. Um, and throwing parties. And so far as I can see, the numbers for both of those have gone through the roof. <laughs> but I was asking the Prime Minister about the 14,000 cases of fraud a day. Many older people duped out of hard-earned savings. And the Business Secretary casually suggests on TV, don't worry, it's not real crime. <laughs> There's a crime gang in, Man in Manchester, Mr Speaker, nicking cars and shipping them around the world, all financed by Covid loans from the taxpayer. Yep, and what's the Chancellor's response? Oh, okay. Write off £4 billion in losses and, and block an investigation by the National Crime Agency. His Cabinet turning a blind eye to scammers. Is it, is it any wonder that his anti-fraud minister realised no one in government seemed to care and threw in the towel. Prime Minister. No, Mr Speaker, because what we're doing is tackling crime across the board. And uh, that's why uh, we're investing more in, in tackling fraud, uh, Mr Speaker, but we're also tackling the neighbourhood crime that is of such massive psychological damage to people in this country, tackling knife crime, uh, tackling burglary, tackling crimes of violence in the street, Mr Speaker, uh, with tougher sentences, which they voted against, by the way, Mr Speaker and putting more police out on the street, Mr Speaker. And the reason we're able to afford it, Mr Speaker, is because we have a strong economy and we're coming back strongly from Covid, and that is thanks to the big calls that this government got right. Big, I think that's probably worth a ding for the big calls the government got right, which is always one of his favourites. Um, uh, Rishi Sunak there um, shaking his head at uh, Keir Starmer. You might not be able to see uh, all that clearly because he's quite a long way down the, down the front bench. You've got Steve Barkley, Peter Patel, Alok Sharma... Anne-Marie Trevelyan and then Rishi Sunak. But, uh, Boris Johnson keeping several bodies between himself and the Chancellor, and just in case. <laughs> but that was an interesting set piece, wasn't it, on both sides? Um, this is going to be one of the big issues at the general election. It, um, if you listen to what Dominic Cummings has been telling the Labour Party, Johnson's former aide, he said, well, if they want to beat the guy I used to work for, they need to hammer crime, and Labour have done that. Uh, reasonably effectively in recent months. Um, and some of the polling suggests that, you know, they're now well ahead. And in a sense, Starmer feels like this is his wheelhouse because, uh, you know, he's a former director of public prosecutions. But, you know, he's trying hard to make this sort of relevant to uh, the punter in the street. Um, Boris Johnson, similarly, you know, has a reasonable story to tell about uh, about knife crime and fights back. I mean, you do wonder about the gang in Manchester exporting cars. I mean, it sounds like they would, they could, should be recruited by the Department for Trade. It's, it's, extraordinary. it's extraordinary. I'm looking at the uh, Manchester Evening News story from a couple of weeks ago. A judge has demanded an investigation after two members of an organised crime gang 
were able to successfully apply for £145,000 in Covid banks back loans. Uh, they exported stolen Range Rovers and other expensive cars to Dubai and got £50,000 in funding offered by the government to help businesses struggling during the pandemic. It would be funny, were it not quite so much money. Uh, let us know um, how you think uh, it's going. What do you think of it so far? You can post comments online on the Times Radio YouTube channel now. Uh, David says, it's a fair start for Starmet, as there's likely to be great interest in crime amongst the electorate. Fraud is widespread. Let us know what you think. Go online, search, uh, go on to YouTube, search the Times Radio. You can watch live. See, see uh, my, my face and Tim Shipman's face. And who doesn't want that at lunchtime? Uh, let's go back to the House of Commons. Question number three from Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, his anti-fraud minister quit, yeah. saying the failure of government to tackle fraud was so egregious that he had to, and this is his words, smash some crockery to get people to take notice. Yeah. Well, it seems that the Prime Minister hasn't noticed the broken plates and the shattered glass all around him. It's almost as if he's been completely distracted for weeks. <laughs> Talking of scams, households are going to have to fork out an extra £19 billion on their energy bills. The government is insulting people's intelligence by pretending it's giving them a discount. But it's not. It's a con. A buy-now-pay-later scheme. A dodgy loan, not a proper plan. <laughs> Mr Speaker, he, he shakes his head. So l let me put this in language you might understand. When his donors give him cash to fund his lifestyle and tell him he has to pay it all back later, are they giving him a loan or a discount? <laughs> Mr Speaker, our, our plan... Our plan to tackle the costs of living is faster, more efficient and more generous than anything uh, that they have set up. Mr. Uh, we've, lifted, we've lifted the living wage by record amounts. Uh, we've, cut the, we've cut the effective tax for people on universal credit, Mr Speaker, and we're now setting out a fantastic plan to help people with the cost of energy, Mr Speaker. And, uh, and it, is, it is more generous and more effective than, more generous and more effective than anything Labour have set out. And the only reason we can do it, it's £9.1 billion, Mr yeah, yeah. Speaker. It's huge sums that we're using to help people across the country. And the only reason we can afford it, Mr Speaker, is because we have a strong economy, the fastest growing in the G7, as I think I may have pointed out uh, to, the, to the right honourable gentleman last week, and uh, not, not just last year, but this year as well. It's interesting, this. So, um, Keir Starmer quoting Lord Agnew, of course. Theodore Agnew, Theodore yes. Agnew, who quit uh, at the dispatch. There was some drama in the House of Lords rather than the House of Commons um, over the, the just refusal to do anything about The fraud. lamentable track record of tackling the sort of fraud in the COVID system. Um, and then, you know, Starmer with another joke. I mean, this is, he's, he is jumping around, as you said. We're now moved on to energy prices, though he seemed to be trying to suggest he didn't quite complete the thought, it seems to me, that, that what the government are offering is, you know, almost a fraudulent scheme themselves. Yeah. I thought he might try and link his previous uh, questions together. But what he's done quite effectively here, you know, he had a joke earlier about, you know, uh, parties in lockdown, you know, and online fraud being the only things you could do. He's now made a sort of barbed comment about uh, Johnson getting uh, money from donors and is that a loan or is it um, a discount? Um, and what you're seeing now is repeated sort of taking the mickey, jibing at him personally, making little gags, which then link into his serious point. And I think, you know... Uh, this, he's sort of getting better at this, isn't he? Well, yeah. Definitely that last one. So the whole point is that Rishi Sunak announced, as Boris Johnson said, a £9.1 billion plan last week uh, to help with energy prices and uh, council tax bills. Although the government uh, will get some of that money back later because it was essentially a loan uh, to uh, energy companies to reduce the bills now and then we'll have to pay the money back uh, as customers later on. But it, what was, I suppose what was clever about that question from Keir Starmer is it's not really a question. Instead of actually asking a question that Boris Johnson might then provide an answer for, he basically is just a, it's just a taking the mick thing. When you when you take a loan off of someone to buy some new curtains, is that a loan or a discount? There's nothing that Boris Johnson can say to that. Um, so he has to wander off and talk about and then he appears to be wandering off to talk about something else. We've moved on to, yes, universal credit and Lord knows what. Um, time for the next question. I, I think. think you might be right. Time for the next question. Uh... <laughs> Um, Boris is full of his, you know what is usual, says someone on uh, YouTube. 
Uh, has Keir taken lessons on PMQs from Rayner, says Stephen. That's an interesting question. Uh, immediately on the same question, Terry says, I'm amazed that such a well-located man is Starmer, a lawyer, ex-DPP, cannot phrase his questions more cuttingly than David Meller. So according to people watching on YouTube, he's doing very well and very badly. Uh, let's go back to question number four. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister clearly hasn't got the first clue what the Chancellor signed him up to. <laughs> so, so let me help him out. His plan is to hand billions of pounds of taxpayers' cash to energy companies and then force families to pay it off in instalments for years to come. If it, if it sounds like he's forcing people to take out a loan, and it looks like he's forcing people to take out a loan, isn't it just forcing people to take out a loan? We are giving people in, uh, in band D council tax, A to D council tax, council tax, houses, council tax valuations across the country, that is 27 million homes, we're giving them the equivalent of a £150 rebate off their council Their offer is for £89, Mr Speaker. Ours is faster, more generous and more effective. And what, and what they would do... And what they were doing, and you know, this is a global problem, Mr. Speaker, caused by the spike in caused by the spike in gas prices. But what they would do is clobber the, the oil and gas companies right now uh, with a with, yes, they, with a with a tax with a tax that would deter investment in gas just when this country needs gas, Mr. Speaker, as we transition to green fuel. It would be totally ridiculous, and it would raise prices for consumers. Yeah. What uh, Boris Johnson William did there is he ignored actually the questions about the energy bills and moved, told about the council tax. That is a genuine discount. That is just money going to take uh, 150 pounds off those uh, from smaller homes uh, band A to D. I think the leader of the opposition somewhat lost his momentum in the question though, didn't he? Yeah. When he st talked about taking out a loon, it which um, <laughs> I've just received a message from uh, someone in government suggesting that he might have been referring to members of his cabinet. <laughs> He's, yeah, but then Boris Johnson's got a bit of a flap as well, trying to remember which... Well, yeah, which, the first ten the seconds of that was... <laughs> that, 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 a, D, a, a to B, A to B, D, 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 D. I think we should probably put that question and answer down as two of the less coherent uh, contributions to this uh, particular show. Yeah, in, I'm, not, uh, I'm not quite sure what it was. and the, move on. I'm not sure what uh, Keir Starmer was asking, and Boris, whatever it was, Boris Johnson definitely didn't answer it. Uh, let's go back then. You don't forget you can watch along live on the Times Radio YouTube channel. Go to uh, YouTube, uh, search Times Radio... Uh, and uh, let us know what you think of it so far. Starmer actually making some decent jokes with some good lines, says Matt. Uh, that might have been before the last exchange. Let's go back to this. Uh, question number five of the House of Commons. Starmer! Mr Speaker, I was always worried that the Prime Minister wasn't one for reading terms and conditions. He didn't understand what the Chancellor signed him up to, and he's just confirmed my worst fears. There is an alternative. But order, order. Can I just say, if you want to carry on, carry on outside. I am not having this perpetual noise coming from the front bench. Secretary of State should know better, and I expect better, and I certainly don't need to put up with it anymore. Keir Starmer. That's uh, Lindsay Hall taking off the government Mr. front Speaker, bench. Mr Speaker, there is an alternative. He could stand up to his Chancellor, tell him to support families rather than loading them with debt. Tell him to look at those bumper profits of oil and gas giants. Shell's profits... Up £14 billion pounds this year. BP's profits up £9.5 billion pounds this year. Mr Speaker, every second of the day, they've made £750 pounds extra profit from rising prices. At the same time, households are facing an extra £700 pounds a year on their bills. Why on earth is this government forced? loans on British families when they should be asking those with an unexpected windfall to pay a little more to keep household bills down. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the Labour plan would clobber supplies. It's an improvement on what he, I thought he stood for, which was nationalising the energy companies. Maybe, <laughs> may, may, maybe, may, he seemed, maybe he's dropped that one now. I, I, I can't tell whether he's dropped that one or not. But, Mr Speaker, what he would be doing, maybe he has, what he would be doing, Mr Speaker, is hitting the energy companies at precisely the moment when we need to encourage them to go for more gas, Mr Speaker, because we need to transition now to, to cleaner fuels. And what this government is providing is £9.1 billion pounds worth of support. It's more generous than anything Labour is offering. And I just repeat my point. The only reason we can do it is because we kept our economy moving in those hard times. 
when they took the wrong decisions. And we, we came out of lockdown in July, Mr Speaker, when he opposed it last year. And we kept going over Christmas and New Year when they opposed it, Mr Speaker. And that's why we have the fastest growing economy in the G7, not just last year, but this year as well. As I never tire of saying. He, he never tires of saying it. It depends, actually, which figures you're using. It does, but the reason he keeps saying it is because the public does generally buy that argument, and pretty much uh, every focus group you sit through, people say, you know, they did, you know, they did the best they could, and um, uh, we're glad that the economy kept kept moving. Um, so actually, he felt pretty comfortable there, giving giving that. That's the most comfortable we've seen Boris Johnson all day. Um, uh, interesting question from Starmer talking about why don't you stand up to your Chancellor. I wonder if there's a bit more of that we'll be seeing over the weeks to come because the real fault line through this government is between Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak in terms of how they plan to pay for all this stuff. Uh, there's been a lot of tension. There's been a lot of suspicion. Is Sunak manoeuvring? Uh, we're told it's all peace and harmony again um, after uh, a meeting last week and a joint appearance earlier this week. And But it's an interesting thread for Starmer. Uh, to, to go on. And we're coming up to, is it Sunday, two years since Wishy Sunak got the job? Remembering he, he got the job because Sati Javid had quit because he wouldn't have the joint unit and having number 10 deciding who could be in his team and who he couldn't. And this was seen as, you know, Wishy Sunak was the patsy, he was the one who was willing to do all that. And actually, the opposite as ever happens, he's almost unsackable. He's proven very popular with voters. Uh, but that creates a real tension between number 10 and number 11. With that, and that, there's always tension, but in the past when there's been tension, it, it came, you know, with Tony Blair and Gordon Brown or even David Cameron and George Osborne. It was born out of an original, you know, they were brothers in arms at the beginning, and that just isn't the case with these two. No, exactly. I mean, they're different ge political generations, um, and um, Sunak was put there, you know, to be not Sajid Javid. And what the, the, the silly thing from Johnson's point of view is that Javid merely was objecting to what was happening with his aides. Um, there wasn't really... Sajid Javid, I think, would have done broadly policy-wise what Boris Johnson wanted him to. Um, Rishi Sunak accepted the joint unit and the aides, but has quite different views about the economy. <laughs> um, and it, it would be wrong to move on without mentioning a second Starmer. Um, um, BP's profits, 9.5 billion points as well. <laughs> so while his structure and his questions have been quite clever, some of his enunciation has been less successful this week. Yes, uh, we're picking up on that. Uh, Lindsay Horn also picking up the, uh, the the cabinet for making too much noise. Joe Pike from Sky News reporting it's quasi quarting. It looked like uh, quasi, The, the business secretary who's... Uh, um, uh, Keir Starmer's been uh, criticising uh, Kwasi Kwarteng for his comments about Ford. He was ticked off for heckling Keir Starmer uh, by the Speaker. Then Kit Malthouse, the policing minister, he's piled in as well and he's uh, got, we've been bickering with Lindsay Hoyle. Uh, that's what's been happening on the government front bench. Uh, somebody's texted in saying, uh, why does the Speaker always reprimand the government benches and not the opposition? That's Andrea. It's a good, I'm not, I mean, he does sometimes tell off the Labour side. I think as a general rule, if you're going to harangue uh, the person at the dispatch box. It's not to do it if you're sitting right next to the speaker. Uh, yes, um, some speakers have good peripheral vision, others don't, but they they can all see what's three feet in front of them. Yeah, I remember, I mean, in particular, uh, Ed Balls used to do it all the time from the front bench sitting opposite Ed Miliband, uh, uh, sitting next to Ed Miliband, which is why David Cameron called him the most annoying man in politics or something. Yeah, no, I think Ed Balls was delighted at that, if yeah, I remember exactly right. right. Exactly right. Uh, right, here we go then. This is PMQ's on Pat. We'll go back to the House of Commons now for the uh, question number six from Keir Starmer. He can bluff and bluster all he likes. The reality is this. On top of the Tory tax rises, on top of the soaring prices, the loan shark Chancellor and his unwitting sidekick have now kicked up a buy now, pay later scheme. It leaves taxpayers in debt, while oil and gas companies say they've got more money than they know what to do with. It's the same old story with this government. Get in a mess, protect their mates and ask working people to pick up the bill. But isn't he worried that everyone can now see that with this Prime Minister and this Chancellor, it's all one big scam and people across the country are paying the price? Mr Speaker, what they can see is a government that is absolutely committed to doing the right thing for the people of this country and, and taking the 
taking the tough decisions when Labour is calling for us to take the easy way out and spend more taxpayers' money. And, Mr Speaker, it was, it was this Government that decided to keep going in July uh, when he wanted uh, to stay in lockdown. We kept going over Christmas and New Year. And, by the way, Mr Speaker, it, it occurs to me uh, that we also were able to use those Brexit freedoms yes. to deliver the fastest boost to work the fastest vaccine road. Yes, Mr Speaker, when he not only voted 48 times, 48 times to go back into the EU, yes he did, uh, but he also voted to stay in the European Medicines Agency, Mr Speaker. And our, plan, our plan for jobs is working, Mr Speaker. Our, our, we have record low youth unemployment. Our plan for the NHS and care is working, Mr Speaker. They have no plan at all, Mr Speaker. Our plan for the country is working. We have a great vision, Mr Speaker, to unite and level up across our country. They have no plan whatever, Mr Speaker. And I say to him, plan beats no plan. We have a great plan for our country. They play politics. I mean, as um, perorations go, I'm not, I mean, it, there's plenty of it. There's a lot of plans um, for a start. Plan, yeah, plan, plan, that they've obviously decided. That they... Well, I'll tell you where this comes from. Um, there's been a lot in the papers that you would have read over the weekend about the return of Linton Crosby, yeah. um, Boris Johnson's uh, former sort of election guru. This is pure Crosby. Crosby believes in people having plans. He told David Cameron to have a... That a plan for, for the economy, long -term you know, the long-term plan. economic plan. You used to ask what it was. The, the view of most Tories at the time was it doesn't matter as long as people think we've got one. Yeah. Boris Johnson, when he was getting re-elected in London in 2012, had a, a, a plan for London. Um, I think there were nine points in it. I remember interviewing him. He could only remember four, but the, <laughs> the point was that it wasn't important. The important, well, the important point was that, that voters understood there was a plan. And he's, you know, we've got a plan for jobs, a plan for the NHS. You know, I mean, most people in government think the NHS backlog is the biggest sort of looming problem they've got but apparently it's working already um, well, you know, and his plan for the country is levelling up, you know, we've got a white paper that doesn't have a great deal in it and uh, but that, you know, as long as you keep saying you've got a plan, that, you know I think we've seen absolutely purely there that Boris Johnson answer, that is his that's what you're going to be hearing all the way up to the next election, and you can bang your bell as much as you want, but uh, <laughs> it ain't going to stop It's interesting, so at 12.17 so I had a couple of questions ago. Uh, somebody's got put R on the text, texted in saying, Johnson is floundering. We're seconds away from hearing long-term economic plan. You could feel it in the water uh, that it was coming. Um, uh, and what about you? We touched on it and you sort of predicted that in the coming weeks, Labour might turn their attention to uh, Rishi Sunak. We didn't have long to wait. We didn't did have we? long to wait. The, the lone, lone shark, shark chancellor. chancellor. Uh, Rishi Sunak uh, is one of the few people on the government front bench wearing a mask, but he, even with his mask on, you could see that he was laughing at that. Yeah, I mean, it makes him probably sound um, rather more um, dynamic and scary than, uh, than he probably yeah. feels himself <laughs> to be. But, um, but no, the combination of the two things I thought was interesting. So lone shark chancellor, that's, that's to damage Rishi Sunak's decent figures with the public. And his unwitting sidekick, um, presumably the Prime Minister, um, that's designed to wind up Boris Johnson and make him irritated. Um, you know, and if you are Labour, if you can drive a wedge between the two of them, you can get the Chancellor to move on, you can get the Prime Minister to move on his Chancellor. Well, something he has already threatened to do in a Downing Street meeting a few months ago. If, if, if Sunak were to get moved in the reshuffle, I think um, uh, that would... Uh, probably look bad for Boris Johnson and Labour, but I think Labour would probably quite like that, looking at, Bor uh, at Rishi Sunak's approval figures. So, What do you think would happen in that situation? Because we've, we, I mean, yesterday's reshuffle is not the one that's going to get the, the nation talking down the dog and duck, but we're, we're told that there's a plan for a bigger summer reshuffle. If, in that situation, Boris Johnson tried to move Rishi Sunak, is that a point at which he might walk, move against it? I think uh, that's possible, Um I've not seen great evidence of Rishi Sunak wanting to uh, move against Boris Johnson. Uh, he gets a lot of jip for probably preparing in case Boris Johnson falls under a bus. Um, but I think it's notable how relatively loyal the Cabinet have been compared with previous uh, sort of moments where it looked like the Prime Minister might fall off their perch. Uh, this is certainly a more loyal Cabinet than Theresa May's was. Um, where every man Jack was um, not just um, uh, preparing for the future, but actively agitating against her. Um, so, yes, if you're Boris Johnson, I can understand why you might be a bit paranoid about Rishi Sunak, but um, Sunak doesn't strike me as the kind of person who's likely to sort of overtly move against him. But equally, you know, if he 
he's not there's probably not any other jobs he wants to do in this government. So and, and who could would he, he at that point offer to walk? You know, who who could he realistically put there would be more malleable? Because part of the problem is that being chancellor, you are you have enormous power because you control all the money. Yeah. I mean, the two obvious candidates are Liz Truss, who's desperate for the job, the Foreign Secretary, and having made her Foreign Secretary, it's more plausible to make her the Chancellor from that post than it would have been from catapulting her up from the business department. Uh, and I guess it, it's uh, it's not impossible that you could see Sajid Javid return there because he seems to be sort of uh, back in with Boris Johnson. Um what about Kwasi Kwarteng, the one making all the noise? <laughs> you know, he's in an economic department. Um, he shares Boris Johnson's worldview. Um, former Etonian, of course. That counts for a little bit, I think, in their world. Um, and, you know, first black chancellor, that's the kind of thing that this prime minister might might fancy doing. Well, there we are. Um, we will take a look at what's happening in the uh, the rest of the questions. We'll do the best of the rest and PMQs uh, in just a moment. Uh, Tim Shipman, Chief Political Com Commentator from the Sunday Times, is still with me. Robert has just tweeted in, I think the co-presenter with Matt on PMQs is wonderful. Really great comments. You work really well together. There we go. Is that, is that a relative of yours? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure who that when is. When I've paid actual money for your stand-up show, well, there this, we is, are. this ill behaves you to yeah, launch Matt, into me now. MattCholly.com if you want to uh, do it. If it's good enough for Tim Shipman, it's good enough for you. Uh, right, coming up, we will do uh, the best of the rest from uh, the back bench questions uh, in, uh, from uh, PMQs after we get a news update from Carmen Bentley. Across the UK, on DAB, online and on your smart speaker, this is Times Radio. Good afternoon. Boris Johnson has given an update on COVID and how the government plans for the country to live with the virus. Provided the current encouraging trends in the data continue, it is my expectation that we will be able to end the last domestic restrictions, no. including the legal requirement to self-isolate if you test positive, a full month early, Mrs yeah. Speaker. The isolation rules were due to end on the 24th of March, but this would bring it to the end of February. The Prime Minister also announced that he will present a strategy for living with Covid on the 21st of February. The Labour leader has told MPs during Prime Minister's questions that the government's plan to help with energy bills is a con. Sir Keir Starmer says the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, is insulting the public's intelligence by pretending it's a discount. A buy now, pay later scheme, a dodgy loan, not a proper plan. He, Mr Speaker, he, he shakes his head. So l let me put this in language you might understand. When his donors give him cash to fund his lifestyle and tell him he has to pay it all back later, are they giving him a loan or a discount? The government's giving households a rebate off their council tax and £200 off bills which will have to be paid back. Boris Johnson said the government is helping people. We've lifted the living wage by record amounts. Uh, we've, cut the, we've cut the effective tax for people on universal credit, Mr Speaker, and we're now setting out a fantastic plan to help people with the cost of energy, Mr Speaker. And, uh, and it, is, it is more generous and more effective than, more generous and more effective than anything Labour have set out. In other news, the Foreign Secretary is flying to Moscow today to encourage the Kremlin to engage and de-escalate tensions over Ukraine. Liz Truss will meet her Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov. She says she'll make clear that an invasion of a sovereign state would bring massive consequences for all involved. Bright and mild in the far south ahead of a band of cloud and patchy rain moving southeastwards. It's brighter but colder in the north with wintry showers, especially across Scotland, where heavy with will hail and rain will fall. Thunder and accompanied gales. Toby Gillis has your sport. TalkSport understands the owners of West Ham stand by the decision to continue playing defender Kurt Zuma, despite the video that's emerged showing him attacking his cat. They left manager David Moyes solely in charge of whether to select him, but do plan to fine Zuma the maximum two weeks' wages if he's found guilty by their internal investigation. Moyes says he found the decision easy from a sporting point of view, even if he struggled with the human element. I'm a big animal lover and I would understand the people who, who would see it see it in, in a bad light. We've spoken, just like they said to, said to everybody else, he's apologised, he's, uh, he's said what he can really. It's very difficult to say an awful lot more. Newcastle legend Shea Given has told TalkSport this morning there can be no complacency at the club. Despite a massive win against Everton last night, it's now two victories on the spin and four unbeaten in the Premier League and they're out of the drop zone for the first time since September. 
but Given says those inside the club won't assume it's job done. You have to sort of stay balanced as well because, you know, the fans in Newcastle will be waking up this morning of a few hangovers probably, but as well with huge excitement and, and thinking, oh, we're safe now. But Eddie Howe and his staff will know there's, there's a long journey to go yet. Former England batsman Nick Compton has told TalkSport he can't believe they've dumped Stuart Broad and Jimmy Anderson for the Test Series with West Indies. I wouldn't say it's a, a dangerous one. I'd say it's a questionable one. And one that beggars belief, to be honest. The legendary bowling pair won't travel for the three matches, which you can hear live and exclusive on TalkSport 2. Compton says it simply doesn't make sense. You're taking out two guys who have been instrumental in any success that England have had. Test cricket for me is about playing the best team that you've got for the next match. And one of Britain's biggest medal hopes at the Winter Olympics will be going home from Beijing empty-handed. World champion Charlotte Banks went out of the snowboard cross in the quarterfinals. Ever had a smart meter display? You know, those little black boxes. I bet you lost it or it stopped working. Don't worry. Now you can get your smart meter on your mobile with the Hugo Energy app. Hugo can also find cheaper energy deals and help you set energy budgets. So come on, truly unlock the power of your smart meter and stay on top of your energy bills. Search Hugo Energy app online. Across the UK, on DAB Digital Radio, on the free Times Radio app, and via your smart speaker. Matt Chorley on Times Radio. Uh, good afternoon. We've just done PMQ's Unpacked. Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer uh, clashing across the dispatch box. Uh, Tim Shipman, uh, Chief of Commentator for the Sunday Times, is still uh, with me. You can still watch along on YouTube. We're now going to take a look at some of the backbench contributions. And uh, right smack bang in the middle of PMQ, some news drops. Uh, the Daily Mirror have got hold of a picture from uh, of Boris Johnson at the number 10 Christmas quiz. You remember he was pictured at that and somebody had tinsel around their necks. Well, these new pictures reveal an open bop bottle of bubbly. Uh, these, there's three members of staff. One of them's wearing tinsel. And another one's got a Santa hat on. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, just as the picture emerged, Fabian Hamilton, the Labour MP, seems to know all about it. And he popped up in the House of Commons uh, to ask this. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker... At the height of the lockdown restrictions in 2020, my constituent, who's worked for the NHS for over 30 years, was diagnosed with a tumour on her spine. Whilst in hospital, undergoing painful surgery, her family obeyed the rules and didn't visit her. Mr Speaker, in the last few minutes, a photo has emerged of the Prime Minister in Downing Street on the 15th of December 2020, surrounded by alcohol, food and people wearing tinsel. It looks a lot like one of the Christmas parties he told us never happened. So for the sake of my constituent and the sacrifices she made, will the Prime Minister be referring this party to the police as it's not one of the ones already being investigated? Prime Minister. Uh, he's, I'm afraid, uh, for, first of all, uh, first of all, I'm very sorry about his uh, constituent and uh, for the difficulties that she's, uh, she's been through. Uh, and I understand, I understand uh, very much her feelings, Mr Speaker. Uh, but in what he has just said, I'm afraid he is completely in error. Well, cool. There we are. So, Tim Schumann, how significant is this? This is the, the, the Christmas quiz. We knew about the quiz, but it wasn't one of the ones which Sue Grace passed on to the police. Uh, no, and I suspect there'll be a lot of pressure for her to have a look at it um, or for them to have an immediate look at it. Um, Boris Johnson sticking to his line that he's not done anything wrong, um, which his aides tell me he profoundly believes. Um, I mean, if you look at the picture, he's sort of hoving into view at the back. Um, yeah, it seems he's entered the room. Uh, it's not clear. He appears to be putting his tie on. Yeah, he's not sort of actually got the bubbles in hand. Um, but that's sort of dancing on the head of a pin. It looks very bad. The only question really is whether MPs and the public are sort of growing a bit weary of all of this. But I suspect having proper... Proper images um, will make a difference. And Dominic Cummings, who, as we know, has been out to get Boris Johnson, uh, he's just tweeting that there are way better pictures of that, including from the flat in, uh, upstairs um, uh, where the Johnsons live. Now, if that is correct and those images come to light, um, then uh, life could get a lot more complicated for Boris Johnson quite so quickly. Do we think that Dominic Cummings has those photos? And if so, why has he not yet put, him on, put them on his hugely popular blog? 
the short answer is I don't know. Um, <laughs> he seems to be aware of something circulating and he seems to be aware of some of the things that have been passed to the police. Um, that may be because he's passed them, it may be because other people have. And I suppose um, it's possible that if someone ha has passed some photos to the police, they might have been told by the police not to publish them. That, that's possible. And the other explanation I think that is plausible is that uh, some of these people are waiting to see what the police do about this. And if the police and or Sue Gray effectively let people off, then that's when you might see a deluge of new pictures effectively saying, this is ridiculous, look at this. Um, so I think there are people um, who would quite like Boris Johnson to be in more trouble are holding their fire to see what um, these investigations make of it. Um, and if they don't get the satisfaction that they want, um, you might see a lot more of this stuff being made public would be my prediction. Oh, well, we won't see what happens on that front. Well, uh, obviously Boris Johnson's uh, carried out as well as carrying out his front bench reshuffle. He's been reshuffling the staff in number 10. Uh, Geeta Harry's been making all the headlines, not necessarily what you want from your new director of communications. Uh, the, the week began with the talk of Boris Johnson singing uh, uh, Gloria Gaynor to him. But uh, probably a more pressing uh, question for Geeta Harry is his work as a lobbyist before uh, going into number 10. Uh, Matthew Pennycook, the Labour MP, has asked this question about Gita Harry's uh, past lobbying the government on behalf of the Chinese tech firm Huawei. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the panic duck Downing Street staffing reshuffle at the weekend, the Prime Minister appointed to a senior role a man who recently lobbied the government on behalf of Huawei Technologies, mm. a ah. hostile state vendor that this House legislated to exclude entirely from our country's 5G networks. Given the number 10 Director of Communications has, by definition, access to some of the most sensitive government information. Yeah. Can the Prime Minister tell the House whether Mr Harry's present role requires enhanced developed vetting and strap clearance and whether he has gone through the necessary checks to provide for that level of clearance before he took up his post? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. A curious question to come from uh, the benches that contain someone who took, I think, £586,000 uh, from the Chinese government to support uh, his office. That's a reference uh, to Barry Gardner, of course, can, Labour MP. What I, can tell that, what I can tell him is that uh, this government took the brave and necessary step of making sure that we excluded, we excluded uh, Huawei from our critical national infrastructure, and that, Mr Speaker, was the right thing to do, whatever he said. Harper. There's a lot going on here, isn't there, with Gita Harry? And this question of what vetting he's, he will go through, because, you know, is it possible, in your experience, to be director of communications and not have the vetting that means that you can basically know what's going on in the government? Well, I think to do that job, um, th there's several things here. Um, one is the, the lobbying charge, though I, it, I generally think lobbying is more damaging in the other direction when people have just left government, have the information, and then go off and effectively sell it to their clients. Um, this is a case where a chap was being employed to work for Huawei. He's now uh, inside government, not now employed by Huawei. Um, the security issue is slightly different. Um, uh, there's lots of different levels of, of security clearance um, and the kind of stuff that Labour are talking about here, which is, is very high security clearance. Develop vetting takes months. Um, they go and interview all your family and lots of your friends and find out uh, in meticulous detail um, how much you drink, what drugs you do, um, your preferred brand of pornography, all that kind of thing. It's very intrusive. It takes a long time. There's no way he's got that already. Yeah. Um, uh, he I will need it... some level of security clearance to see the ba the normal papers that are the cut and thrust of government. Um, that can be done relatively quickly with a MI5 background check of the kind that uh, those of us that have Westminster lobby passes um, go through all the time. Um, they'll then look in a bit more detail for people who need higher security clearance. Um, but for for what they're calling, you know, develop vetting, DV as they call it, and strap clearance, which is the very highest um, sort of level, um, Papers that are sort of top secret um, then have strap um, uh, status slapped on top of them. And strap basically means that it's limited to specific named individuals. I don't think a director of communications needs that, frankly. Um, and it would be very unusual for them to have that. There will be some people in ministerial roles who will have that. Um, and there'll be some uh, people, some of their ministerial aides will have that if they're in, say, the Home Office or the MOD. Yeah. Uh, where they're dealing with um, this stuff all the time. In number 10, I wouldn't have thought Harry needs that uh, to do his job. Finally then, um, because we talked about it right at the very beginning, there's this Jimmy Savile uh, issue, and there was a question of whether or not Boris Johnson was going to resign. It seemed unlikely, it has to be said. Uh, but the Labour MP, Ruth Jones, uh, it fell to her to raise this in the House of Commons. 
Uh, so let's take a listen. Uh, this is what Speaker, Chad said. I understand the Prime Minister has been heard singing I Will Survive in recent days. <laughs> I would suggest that he would be better off singing Careless Whisper instead because, Mr Speaker, in 2017, Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe was condemned to an extended prison sentence yeah. in Iran because of the careless words of this Prime Minister. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in 2022, this week, my friend, the Leader of the Opposition, was hounded by thugs outside yes. this Parliament yes. because of the careless disgraceful words of this Prime Minister. So will the Prime Minister do the decent thing? Will he reconsider his words, repent and resign? Mr Speaker, I, I don't think that she should either let the thugs and yobs who uh, bullied and uh, harassed uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman off the hook any more, because they are culpable, any more than she should let the Iranian government off the hook, Mr Speaker, because they are culpable. Well, there we are. Then he sat down. Um, Neither re repentance nor, no. nor resignation. <laughs> we consider repent and resign. It seemed unlikely that he was going to take her up on that offer, but um, but slightly less bullish. He just, you know, basically Boris Johnson tried to give an answer there that, that won't be used again or repeated on the news. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't like that very much, and um, you know, um, at some level. Um, even he may be feeling slightly embarrassed about it, but um, yeah, he didn't. He didn't take the opportunity to repeat uh, the name Jimmy Savile or, or relink it to uh, to. Um, but Stark. again, Labour's sort of sensibly leaving it to the backbenchers to yeah. do the pointed stuff, and and Starmer can look a bit more statesmanlike and doesn't have to special plead for himself. Essentially, the lovely stuff. Well, there's a lot there. There's a lot there too. Yeah, uh, to, I mean, in a sense, that in. was a sort of, as you say, it was a bits and pieces PMQs, but actually, that was one of the livelier ones for a little while. Um, and uh, although I suspect that probably out there in the real world, as we'll say, probably the most significant thing for most people uh, was the announcement right at the very beginning that Boris Johnson announcing that uh, they're going to bring forward uh, the end to the COVID isolation rules due to uh, end on 24th of March. It's not going to happen at the end of February. Uh, all part of the strategy of living with COVID. Uh, lovely stuff. Uh, well, that's enough of living with PMQs. Uh, Tim Shipman, lovely to see you, Chief Political Correspondent of The Times. Uh, thank you for watching along on the YouTubes. Uh, we'll be back same time. In fact, we won't be back same time next week. It's one recess. We'll be back in two weeks' time with PMQs Unpacked. Uh, right, up next, though, uh, we are going to talk farmers. Uh, farmers have been told to be nice to people wandering onto their land. No more uh, chasing them off and saying, get off my land. We'll find out uh, how that's gone down with farmers. And then...